What is the book of Hebrews about? What do all the references to the Jewish past way of worship have to do with us? Didn't the Jews automatically give it all up when they became Christians? As you'll see in our lesson today, the book of Hebrews, which is a little longer and more complex than some when read in context, is far more than a history lesson, but it can give us confidence and trust in God now. I'm Von Pran with Bible 805, where you learn to know, trust, and apply the Bible. And you'll learn more about Hebrews than you could ever imagine was possible in our lesson today entitled, The Book of Hebrews, God's Eternal Plans Made Real in the Church and in Us. The place of Hebrews in our Bible and faith, it can be confusing if you simply pull it out of the Bible and read it on its own. But when you read it in context, after the Old Testament and as the early Christian faith was forming, it helps you to see how God is the author of all human and salvation history. How God does this in Bible history with foreshadowing what are called types and their fulfillment in Acts and Hebrews, why this was important to clarify this relationship in the early church and in the founding of the church, and what it means for us today is what our lesson is all about. When we understand this view of history as taught in detail in Hebrews, it becomes one of the best apologetic resources in the Bible. Now, why do I say that? Isn't that usually tough questions and what about the flood and all those kind of different things? No, apologetic simply means a defense of our faith and understanding how God fulfilled what he promised in the Old Testament through Jesus. It was essential for the early church, but it can also be essential for us today because before we can defend our faith to others, we need to be able to defend it to ourselves, to be assured in our hearts that we can truly trust it. The historical realities of the book of Hebrews, I think, will help do that. They really did for me. I know when I studied the Bible and I studied how God has worked through the centuries, how he promised things literally millennia ago and then fulfilled them in details, that has given me just a tremendous confidence in my faith. And the reason that is, is because only a God outside of time could do this. Only a God who existed from all eternity could set up all the Old Testament pictures of what was to come in Jesus and then have the details of Jesus' life fulfilled meticulously down to the smallest details. Now, how does this happen in Hebrews? How does Hebrews help us understand this? Well, it goes way back with the reality that God picked a people to work with throughout human history. Now, I was thinking, now, why did he do that? And doesn't he just love everybody? But when you think about it, it makes really common sense to just focus on one story, on one group of people. Now, by watching how God interacted with them, the rest of the world was able to see God at work. And it wasn't that God said nobody else could be saved, nobody else could join in, anyone, anytime, anywhere was welcome to become part of that story. And many people did. Throughout Jewish history, you see how many people did join the Jewish people, and they participated in the Jewish religion. And we'll see how the descendants of many of these people were the ones who came to Pentecost to hear Peter when the church started. And not only that, but there are many stories throughout the Old Testament that show us how God was at work outside of just the nation of Israel. The story of Job, who was not a Jew, of Jonah, of Nebuchadnezzar, all of these different stories, which we don't have time to go into now, but I have lessons on them. Just look on the Bible 805 website and find them that show that God was actively involved in people all around the world. But regardless of various place and people he worked with, the focus of his story is that from the time Adam and Eve sinned, God promised a Redeemer. The history of our Bible and all the various things that happened in the history, the laws, the sacrifices of the Jewish people, all of this was to show what was coming with the Messiah. 
And then the New Testament shows the fulfillment of all that was promised. And then Hebrews was written as a summary of this process that all had happened, all that had been prophesied before, all that had happened before, all that had been pictured in the life of the Jewish people was now fulfilled in Jesus. Now, of course, Hebrews is not going to make sense to you if you don't read what came before. This is one of the reasons why I so strongly recommend that you do read through the entire Bible every year so you see God's whole span of history. But if you've been with me with Bible 805 throughout the year, you know what came before. And not only does it help put Jesus in historical perspective, but it helps us understand who is the true Jesus. And it helps us distinguish the true Jesus from many false pictures of him. Because when we look at how the Bible actually foretold and described him in the past, we see how the real Jesus is congruent with the picture of what he, the real Jesus that we know today that was in the New Testament, is congruent with what was prophesied in the past. And the real Jesus specifically fulfilled the prophecies that it was written that he would fulfill. Now, false ideas about Jesus then and now, the Jews thought that the Messiah was going to be someone who would rescue them from the Romans, and the Old Testament never said that, if you read it correctly. They wanted a conquering military hero. That's what they wanted it to say. That's what they read back into it. But that isn't what it says if you really look at it. That's not what he was promised to be. They had to ignore so many other passages that described the Messiah, that described what he was going to do, that described his purpose, that he was going to be a redeemer to make the Messiah fit into their mold. And people make the same mistake today. They don't look at the true Jesus of the Bible. They want to make him into some sort of magical answer to all their needs. Someone whose only wish for all of his people is to make them healthy and wealthy. And that just isn't true. These ideas are not supported either by prophecies incorrectly interpreted about Jesus or the true story of his real life. Now, I want to take a little parenthesis here because this is kind of critical. If you don't think you fall into that, check out your prayers. What do you pray for? What do you expect Jesus to answer in your prayers? Do you pray your kingdom come, your will be done? Do you ask for growth in godliness, to become more and more like Jesus, to be a blessing to others, to develop the fruits of the Spirit? Or do you primarily pray for earthly health and wealth? Now, maybe you wouldn't say, oh, I don't, I don't do that. I don't want to be wealthy. But are your prayers just mostly about temporal blessings about what you want God to do for you um, in your family, in your finances this week, whatever. Now, it's not wrong to pray that, but if that's the majority of your prayers, you might kind of want to look at at what's going on. Do you pray for those in the church, your Christian friends? I have a handout that I'm actually going to do a separate little video on because it's kind of lengthy where I share with you the prayers of Paul, but just look at how he prayed for the people that he was working with and he cared about in the churches. If we don't like what's going on in our churches, pray some biblical prayers for them. And again, I'll have another short video on that that I think you'll find very, very interesting. But look at your prayers. What is it that you pray for? Now remember, Jesus will answer every prayer for health and wealth and unimaginable blessings in heaven. But that might not be what he wants for you on this earth. It certainly wasn't for himself, for many of his followers. And he had to come as Messiah first, as the Savior, as the Christ first, before he could pave the way for us to go to heaven and ultimately have all the blessings we dream of. But I want you to stop and think, what does that actually mean? We talk about Jesus Christ, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't really understand what that means. Here's how uh, the God Answers a really good website that puts many biblical questions in understandable language puts this. It says, to the surprise of some, Christ is not Jesus' last name, his surname. Christ comes from the Greek word 
Christos, meaning anointed one or the chosen one. This is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Masayach or Messiah. Jesus is the Lord's human name given to Mary by the, by the angel Gabriel. Christ is his title, signifying Jesus was sent from God to be a king and deliverer. Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Anointed Ones. And there are hundreds of prophetic messages in the Old Testament that refer to the coming Messiah who would deliver his people. Ancient Israel thought their Messiah would come with military might to deliver them from decades of captivity. But the New Testament reveals a much better deliverance provided by Jesus the Messiah, a deliverance from the power and penalty of sin. This understanding that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one they'd been looking for, unfortunately, it wasn't obvious to the people even after his death and resurrection. Why they didn't understand it when they'd been looking for it for centuries, we don't really know. But they didn't seem to grasp who he truly was, even those who trusted him as Savior. Confirming and explaining this link. Now, this is really important. Bear with me. We're going to kind of get into the weeds on discussing this, but I, I think you'll see some stuff you might not have seen before in the Bible. Let me say that again. Confirming and explaining this link between what thousands of years of history and prophecy foretold and linking it to the life of Jesus. That was, when you look at it, the primary message in the early history of the church. It's all through Acts, and we're going to go through that. I want you to see this. And then Hebrews is a summary of it. First, we're going to look at how this key idea is repeated again and again in the book of Acts. The church begins at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends. It's a huge event. Peter stands up to explain it, where it says he stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. They heard them talking in all different languages, and they understood them in their own language, even though they were Jews. He says, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That was the experience of the people hearing that God had given them the Messiah, that everyone who called on the name of the Lord would be saved. That was their experience. And then he has to tell them why it happened and what it was all about. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God, now listen carefully. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Jesus was the one who'd long been prophesied. He wasn't just any Savior God, not just some new uh, one who came along who would make their, your life better now, but this one, this Messiah, who they'd heard about and looked forward to all their lives. As we go through Acts, we see that proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah wasn't just the message from Peter at this first initial gathering in Jerusalem. It was his consistent message and the message of others. And let me go through this because I know I didn't really see it until I studied it this time. And I want you to really understand it. After healing the crippled man, he says, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. 
And then, after being flogged for telling the people about Jesus, it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now consider the uniqueness of this message. It wasn't just about what Jesus could do for them. He healed, he fed the people, and they kind of tended to focus on that. But the emphasis was on what he did. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. This is what made him the God to believe in. Stephen, the first martyr, continues the tie to the Old Testament when in Acts 7.51, he's talking to them and he says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you've betrayed and murdered him referring to Jesus, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but you didn't obey it. The core message continues. Philip shares with the Ethiopian eunuch from the passage of Isaiah 830 that Jesus was the prophet, was the one who Isaiah was talking about. Saul Paul begins his ministry, and here's his theme of it in Acts 9, 19, right after he had the encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. It says, Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? Jerusalem among all who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Then listen to this. He says, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. His regular pattern as he goes on his journeys was to continue. In Acts 13, it says, When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. And he, here's how he starts out by saying, Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Then the pattern changes somewhat. Um, They go to Iconium, they went to the Jewish synagogue, but then apparently, as we'll see later, because it talks about just a crowd, they go out of the synagogue and they go by a man, it says, who was lame. He'd been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was a chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Now, of course, Paul and Barnabas stopped him, but this little picture shows why you can see that it's important that Paul preferred to preach his message in a context where people would get the proper interpretation from it without the historical setting, what the prophets preached, then this is what Jesus did. You see, people could wrongly understand what a miraculous healing was all about. So it became his custom that, once again, it goes on, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving 
that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Again, the history, the context, Jesus fulfilled it. This was his pattern. But he gets kicked out. He goes to Berea. And then interesting passage there, it says, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, but they didn't just trust that what he said is what the Old Testament says, because it says they examined the scriptures every day, every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result, many of them believed. They checked out Paul's message to make sure that it did line up with the Old Testament scriptures. And because it did, many believed. Now, he continues in Corinth and Ephesus, and again, in both of them, he starts out in the synagogue, but in both of these locations, when the people, when the Judaizers, who said they had to follow all the Jewish laws and all kinds of different things, disagreed with them, he simply moves elsewhere in the city and teaches for an extended period of time. An application that's important here is it takes time to learn new ways, new things about God, and it took time for them to realize that this new faith wasn't really entirely new. It was a continuation of what they had always been taught. Also, in these areas, because they probably didn't have as great of Old Testament background, didn't know what all Jesus had done, he didn't get the quick response Peter did in Jerusalem speaking to devout Jews. And an application here is we really need to take time to explain the Christian faith to people, to learn it ourselves, especially if we don't really know all of our Bibles. We have the audience today of Paul, not Peter. People even many Christians who didn't grow up knowing the Word of God. And so one of the things I want to say on this too, don't be hard on yourself if you find books like Hebrews confusing or if there's different parts of the Bible that are confusing. Please, please take the time to read all of it. Bible 805, my lessons, I have all sorts of things that will help you in this because many parts of the Bible won't make sense until you learn the entire Bible. Finally, even outside of the synagogue, his message was consistent. When he was preaching to King Agrippa, he ends up by saying, I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. First to last, his message was rooted in the Old Testament. That is what gave his message authority and power. Our message is part of God's plan of redemption for his people. It's shown in partial form in the Old Testament and revealed fully in the life of Jesus in the New Testament. This is what, from the start, they preached. But apparently, it was really difficult for them to comprehend. And that's where Hebrews comes in. <laughs> I know you're thinking, isn't this lesson about Hebrews? Yeah, well, you know, you needed the setup first. This is where Hebrews comes in and shows us in more detail how what was in the Old Testament was now relevant to the New Testament audience. In what, some ways, I imagine the book of Hebrews as, you might say, sort of an extended transcript of what Paul and others, especially when you look at the story of Priscilla and Aquila, and Apollos in Acts 18, 24 through 26, what they shared with Apollos is, I think, what then whoever the writer of Hebrews is shared with the Jewish people who had a background in the Old Testament, but who, who needed to really be walked through the whole thing of how Jesus fulfilled it as a result of their interactions. It says that the, their interactions, that is, of Aquila and Priscilla with Apollos. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos. Well, let me just read you his whole story here. Uh, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew about the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. 
Listen to this then. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. What Aquila and Priscilla shared with him, then what he shared, I think we can see is the content of Hebrews. Hebrews begins by assuring us that God's final word to us is his son. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus sustaining all things by his powerful word. The book of Hebrews then goes on to discuss in detail the various ways Jesus fulfilled the types in the Old Testament. And you're kind of thinking, types, what's that all about? Well, that requires another explanation, which I'm going to go into now. Hebrews it, overall is a primary example of what's called typology, which is a key to understanding the relationship between the Old and New Testament. I'm quoting out of Henry Vickler's book, Hermeneutics, where he says, Typology is based on the assumption that there's a pattern in God's work throughout salvation history. God prefigured his redemptive work in the Old Testament and fulfilled it in the New. In the Old Testament are shadows of things to be more fully revealed in the New. The ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, for example, demonstrated to Old Testament believers, the necessity of atonement for their sins. These ceremonies pointed forward to the perfect atonement made in Christ. The prefigurement is called the type. The corresponding figure, the fulfillment, is called the anti-type. Now, what in the world is that all about? What did I just say? It, it, this, well, this can be really confusing. And the reason it can be so confusing is because when you read many biblical commentaries, They'll talk about something being a type in the Old Testament. For example, the fact, sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament was a type of Christ's future death on the cross. So far, that makes sense. But then, many commentaries go on to say that Christ's death was the antitype. Well, <laughs> you know, the way we use the word anti means opposite. That it's, you know, and if it's opposite, why do we call the fulfillment the antitype? Well, that's because the actual Greek word, which we don't know, but all these commentators do, so they assume we do. But anyway, uh, the Greek word antitype in this usage is actually the Greek word antitupos. And what that means is corresponding as an impression to the die. It's you take a die and you strike something. The die is the type. What you strike and what comes out is the antitype. Now, then, when I heard that, that made great sense to me because, now bear with me here, one of the many jobs that I've had in my long work life is I used to be a, pub well, I still do it, actually, a publication designer. And part of being a publication designer is an understanding of topography. The term anti-tupos, corresponding as an impression to the die, makes perfect sense when you think of it in terms of setting type. When type is set to the typesetter, it is. It looks upside down and backwards. It's all there, but it's not easy to read. But when the impression of it is made, the anti-type, the anti-tupos, the meaning's clear. Now, here's an illustration of it. I On the video, I show you the type of Merry Christmas that's upside down and backwards, but then you print it. It's really clear. It makes perfectly good sense. And here's how this ties into Hebrews. The Old Testament tabernacle is identified as a type in Hebrews. The first tabernacle was a figure for the time then present. The high priest entrance into the holiest place once a year prefigured the mediation of Christ, our high priest. Later, the veil of the tabernacle is said to be a type of Christ in that his flesh was torn, as the veil was when he was crucified, in order to provide entrance into God's presence for those who are covered by his sacrifice. The whole sacrificial system is seen as a type in Hebrews 9, 19 through 26. So let me go into some specific examples of how Jesus was this type in the tabernacle that Hebrews refers back to and then says 
this is what happened. Outside the tabernacle, Jesus describes himself as the door. There was only one way into the tabernacle, only one way to get to God. The altar for sacrifices is what you needed to come to next, and the sacrifice had to be made again before you could come to God, which Jesus had to be sacrificed to make it possible for people to approach a holy God. But this was never enough. Once you were on the inside, you came to the Holy of Holies, where you had the place where there was the incense and the bread and these different things uh, prefigured Christ as the light of the world, Christ as the bread of life. But then in the Holy of Holies, where there was the Ark of the Covenant, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priests would pour out the blood. It covered sins, but it didn't take them away. And Hebrews talks about how when Jesus shed his blood, that was the final sacrifice. And then after that, what was really neat is it the way was made open to God. And um, what happened when Jesus actually died on the cross, the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies was actually 60 feet long, 30 feet high, and four inches thick. And when Jesus died on the cross, when he said, it is finished, the veil was torn in two. And now, visually, it was illustrated to people that the entrance to God was open to everyone because of the death of Jesus. What had been a symbol, a type of separation, now became one of free access. And again, this is what Hebrews is telling us. All these things were foretold in the past. They came true in Jesus even when he was alive. Um, in the New Testament, John the Baptist sees him coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, of course, he's referring to Jesus. And can you imagine what an extraordinary thing that was for the people to hear that who had seen animals sacrificed all their lives, and now the true sacrifice is there. If you were spiritually aware, what an incredible time it was. But, not everyone wanted to accept Jesus for what he was. And there are so many uh, more Old Testament types. The law, the sacrificial system, the setup of the tabernacle, everything. What the priest did, especially the high priest. All of these things were types of what Hebrews says, now the reality is in Jesus. And Hebrews then goes through step by step, showing you Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a high priest who lives forever. Jesus did this. Jesus did that as our ultimate Savior. Now, this whole progression is also known as progressive revelation. Now, it's important to understand that that just means a better fulfillment, not that it changes. The Mormons and some other churches say that progressive revelation means that God can totally change his mind and bring in a new church, bring in a new savior, bring in all this and that. No, this is a progression of what God has taught from the earliest days. Now, believing these things and trusting God to fulfill them, to fulfill what he said, what he was going to do, this is the faith that was commended in Hebrews 11. Not that they, sh they just had faith in whatever they believed in or wanted to, but in this whole history of the promises of God, that he would fulfill what he promised. In Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, it says, Each one of these people of faith died, not yet having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it way off in the distance, waved their greeting, and accepted the fact that they were transients, strangers, and pilgrims in this world. People who live this way make it plain they're looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they would have gone back any time they wanted. But they were after a far better country than that, heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. Now what? What's our application? In Hebrews 12, it says, we are part of a long distance race. Do you see what all this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. 
Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Part of running this race might mean discipline. In Hebrews 13, 7, it says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? Final applications. With Hebrews, we see both the broad expanse of God's work and the minute details he used each step of the way. And this should inspire us to trust his control of human history. Trust his control of our history. Remembering challenges are meant to help us become all he created us to be. Lay aside the weights that slow you down. Keep rearranging your life as his disciple. And run with endurance the race that is set out for you. That's all for now. Please check out the notes and links to related materials, including videos, podcasts, infographic, a transcript of the lesson, all sorts of things, plus material links to material that you can use to teach this lesson at www.bible805.com. And do please sign up for the newsletter so you'll receive updates of materials as they're created and posted. And a huge request. Please tell your friends about these resources. These are challenging days, and Bible 805 has many resources that will help you know, trust, apply, and now also teach the Bible. Until next time, I'm Yvonne Prin, your fellow pilgrim, writer, and teacher for Jesus, and I'd like to close with this benediction. May you know the invitation of God to move from confusion to clarity, from wandering to rest, from loneliness to knowing you are loved, from turmoil to peace, from wherever you are on your spiritual journey to a growing knowledge of God's Word and in your personal relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.